Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics. With me, Adrian Goldberg, I'm an investigative journalist, West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder. We've also got, as usual, Charlton Athletics Chief Executive Charlie Methven. And this week we're celebrating the achievements of women's football and asking whether it's heading in the right direction now that the Women's Super League and the Women's Championship have been taken over by a body independent of the FA. Who better to talk to about this than our special guest, Kelly Simmons, OBE. Kelly worked at the FA for more than 30 years, ending up as director of the women's professional game. And she is now a sports consultant. Charlie also has responsibility for women's football at the Valley. And I've got a nine-year-old daughter who plays in goal every week regularly for her local team. So uh, welcome all. And uh, before I speak to you, Kelly, welcome, by the way, just to say hello. Mm -hmm. Thanks Charlie, you you've been really keen to talk about this. You've got a bit bit of a bee in your bonnet about this, haven't you? Um, yes, I do. Um, and I'm going to be fascinated to hear what, what Kelly's got to say about it because my bee, the bee in my bonnet is the gap between the rhetoric spoken by people who don't have to actually operate women's football clubs and the reality faced by people who do operate women's football clubs. Um, it's it's become, in my mind, free virtue signalling um, for people who have no financial skin in the game and who don't really have to deal with commercial consequences of what they think or what they say or, 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 or anything like that. And those of us who then have to make what they've decided work um, or what they think should happen work. Um, and that's one side of it. The other side of it, which I don't have a beer in my bonnet about, is obviously being very interested in um, the overall more medium to long-term development of the sport for girls, um, which when I was growing up and probably, you know, we're all of the same generation on this call, um, you know, my sister, who was a very, very able sportswoman, it was never an option for her to play football. Um, you know, she, she had to play netball, lacrosse, hockey um, and tennis were really the only ball sports that she had any encouragement to play. And football at any of the schools she was at simply wasn't on the wasn't on the curriculum at all. So uh, those are the two sides of the discussion as as I see it. Um, but I don't know. What about you, Adrian? What what are you looking forward to uh, discussing with, with with Kelly? Well, I'm interested to know about both sides of it. Really, the grassroots development of the game, which I'm personally invested in, as I say, but also the professional side of it. I'm concerned that the women's Super League and the women's Championship may perhaps be replicating some of the mistakes that I see in the men's professional game. And that's something I know Kelly has written about in The Guardian recently. But Kelly, tell me firstly about your involvement in the game itself, because you were a player and you've seen this evolution that Charlie has talked about. Yeah, very much. I wasn't allowed to play at school. Um, uh, women's football wasn't banned then. Um, it recently come out of the ban by the time I went to school, but really culturally. It might as well have been banned because there was no opportunities to play and it was just deemed a boys' sport. So, uh, as you were saying, Charlie, really, you know, we were channeled off into different sports. Um, so I didn't really play and then get my coaching qualifications until I went to university, um, but I ended up in football by chance. Got a chance to work with Howard Wilkinson. We put the England youth pathways in, the talent pathway, the Girls' Centres of Excellence, which the Lionesses came through that went on to win European Championships then went over to work in men's and women's football as director of development, changing the way kids play football, bringing in the respect programme, driving up coaching qualifications, trying to improve the environment and coaching for boys and girls, but obviously a big focus on trying to get girls into football, both in schools uh, and in clubs, um, and, and give girls the opportunity to actually play the game and build the base of the game. And then, yeah, 2018 went in, Martin Glenn, who's the chief executive at the time, asked me to go in and do this transformational change piece on the WSL. And um, I went in, it was, um, you know, there was zero revenue, uh, a few hundred people watching each game, um, the occasional game on TV. And um, really, you know, all the FA were doing really at that point was really organising the fixtures and sort of regulating the competition. And, and obviously went on a journey to sort of, you know, where it is now in terms of uh, recommending it came out of the FA as a, a separate company with a laser focus which um, at that point I'd done five years of 
WSL and Championship and the pyramid and and stepped away. So yeah, but quite quite a long, uh, heavy involvement in and a big passion to see the game drive forward. Yeah, and in terms of grassroots, I know the FA published a report recently about their strategy inspiring positive change. That reports that in the last four years, the number of women and girls playing football has increased by fifty six percent. Of course, we've had the successes of the Lionesses being European champions. Re- reaching the Euro- the World Cup final as well. The number of underrepresented groups playing football, women's football has increased as well. So at a grassroots level, I don't think anybody could deny that, although there is no doubt as ever work to be done, that women's football has been a phenomenal success story. No, very much. And I think I read um, recently that more women play football the men and women play rugby and a lot of people would think rugby you know it's sort of football rugby cricket or rugby uh rugby or cricket second or third um but in terms of participation the, the growth in girls football by being given the chance to play what is our national sport and girls and women you know love football and are football fans it's absolutely flourished i, I did a report recently which launched uh was published a couple of weeks ago for the football foundation um looking at their investment in uh, women's football and what they need to do because by 2030 it's estimated that one in five of all affiliated teams in this country will be female I can remember the first girls football team count when we found 80 across the country so um, it just shows you and, and that you know says that things have to be different we have to really invest in facilities and uh, in the right facilities that consider the needs of girls and that we give more priority access to those priority slots where girls have struggled, girls and women have really struggled to get on those because they've been block booked for years by uh, male football. So, yeah, so there are lots of important things still to do. But, yeah, an, an absolute success story, I think, the growth of the game. And you were part of the movement to separate the women's professional game away from the FA for whom you work to create a, an independent women's professional organization effectively which governs both the WSL and the women's championship just tell me about the thinking behind that yeah so when I first went in in 2018 the clubs were um, pretty unhappy with the FA and how much sort of effort and focus was going on um, the WSL particularly at that point and um, and I was literally just coming in to, to post on it and and we sat down and we said look you know we'll work together we'll build out a vision and strategy for the game um We'll start to drive revenue growth, but we'll also conduct, a, you know, a proper ownership review, and we'll, we'll take time to work through with you what we think is the right structure. And I suppose, in essence, having worked in the FA, which has so many things to do and so many competing priorities, and commercially, it's often out looking for commercial partners around England, men and women, men's FA Cup, um, which is the biggest revenue generator, etc. It's got all these priorities and. And I'm, you know, in, in my job, constantly sort of knocking on the door, pushing and asking for more support uh, in terms of the WSL. And so there was, you know, there felt like there was sort of commercial conflicts and and that there was the lack of um, complete, fo- you know, organisational focus and the right amount of people with the right amount of expertise really driving the game forward. And you sort of look across the pond at the NWSL, which is independent, um, and you see sort of the, the resource and expertise they'd got to drive, you know, and we were sort of like neck and neck, really. Aren't you? you know, you could argue either way, which is the best league. Um, but it felt like it was the right thing to do to come out. It should be, you know, we wanted the clubs to own it. I think many of the clubs did want to own it. It'd be interesting to get Charlie's opinion on that. And certainly um, the clubs in the WSL definitely, uh, I think, wanted to come out and uh, to, to be more like, a, I suppose, a, a mini Premier League model in a club-owned model with a dedicated executive and a governance and executive that's completely focused on getting up in the morning thinking, how are we going to make this sustainable long-term? How are we going to drive revenue? How are we going to build our audience? How are we going to monetize it? How are we going to ult- ultimately make it sustainable rather than thinking about loads and loads of different things across the game? So, so yeah, that was the recommendation and and that was that's what's happened, obviously, with some Premier League support in there as well. Yeah, I think they've lent 20 million quid to the new league to get it off the ground, to the new organisation. So, Charlie, you can understand the logic behind that, can't you? So where in practice do you think there are concerns? 
Um, well, first of all, I sort of right up until the very last bit, there's all, some nothing that Kelly said that I would disagree with. Um, and as I said, I'm very passionate about girls football. Um, we run a girls academy here at Charleston, which not all um, uh, professional women's football clubs do. Of, of getting towards being comparable sort of to our boys academy, which is also a very large academy. Um, and pretty much every Sunday I can, I go to watch our women's team. They're away at Blackburn today, so it's not quite so straightforward. But generally speaking, home and away, I'd want to go and watch our women's team. Um, and I, I do see it as a, you know, as a growth sport at a professional level, not just the participation level. Um, and I think that something of value could have been created, but unfortunately has not been um and uh, and that's why i come to my disagreement with kelly which is the very last bit she said that the focus is on making it sustainable i don't see it i don't see that at all i see it just simply repeating all the same mistakes as the men's game but probably twice as bad roughly speaking twice as bad they have no cost control at all in the men's game we're desperately trying to foist co cost controls onto ourselves to try to, to to try to help make us sustainable, and this is in a well-established professional sport with massive revenues, where there are substantial numbers of clubs breaking even or, or making a profit. We are still trying to put the genie back in the bottle in men's football, and then for me, the Carney report has come along, and this is based off. I totally get it, and I understand it. A long-standing resentment about not being like the men's game, and they've gone right. We just want we want to be like the men's game. We want to have all the goodies that the men's game have got without understanding that those that's running the men's game are desperately trying to sort of, you know, row back on all that rubbish. Um, so where, where we landed, where have we landed? Where we've landed is in a position where in the WSL Championship, which is where Charlton compete, and last season, Charlton failed to get promoted by one point to WSL 1. So we would be considered one of the premier clubs in the division. We're currently first in that division. If you speak to the chief executives in that division, 80 to 90 percent of us do not want to get promoted and that is an absurd result of um, i'm afraid of, i'd be very critical and, I, and perhaps not surprised given that karen carney has no commercial experience whatsoever a, a, a terrible report by karen carney which literally tried to replicate um as i said all the worst bits of of, of, of the men's game kelly compared our wsl to the nwsl in the states which is a phenomenal product but that was already up and running and successful. And then we decided, oh, no, no, we in England know better than that. We know that we can do something much better than that. We can try and repeat our men's game rather than repeating the NWSL. And in my mind, what should have happened is we should have repeated the NWSL. That works. And I think this, just to conclude my thoughts, be interesting Kelly's thoughts on this. Women's professional football as a product is not the same as men's professional football because it cannot draw upon the historic generational support of men's prof professional fans. It is comparable instead to other startup or relatively new professional sports that has to fight for audience, fight for TV audience, fight for live attendance audience, fight for audience. And to do that, it needs investment. And to get that investment, it needs certainty. You do not have the prospect that we have in the men's game of women's professional football clubs unlike men's professional football clubs, being sold for 100, 200, 300, 400 million pounds, which then encourages very rich people to pour vast sums of money into them, right? So that that is a central core problem. It is much more similar in type to other sports like women's rugby, for instance. Um, and if you were to say to women's rugby, oh yeah, well, we're going to set up a pyramid with no cost controls, with absolute free for all, but it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter what the attendances are, we're just going to sort of keep on pouring, pouring more, more, more money in. And if you then get to the nub in, in Karen Carney's report and other utterances, question, who's going to pay for it? Right. That, that's the question that I keep coming back to. And the answer basically is, oh, well, I mean, surely the men's professional football club owners will understand that they should just lose lots of money on this. I mean, surely they should understand. That's a brilliant idea that they should just uh, lose lots of money. And then surely Sky TV should understand it's a brilliant idea for them to lose lots of money on it. Surely everyone should just understand that there is a moral imperative to lose lots of money in women's professional football. And that's where we've got to now. And it's, you know, for a lot of people in, in, in my industry, i.e. people who run football clubs, there is a see no evil, hear no evil approach where they'll tell you all of this behind closed doors. That if I came out and said that, I'd be hung, hung drawn and quartered. I've got to be seen to be fully supportive of everything, et cetera. And in the meantime, 
what I'm actually doing is cutting back on spending well with my women's team. I'm putting my women's professional players on minimum wages, or I'm trying to deprofessionalize, or I'm trying to go down at another level, whatever it might be, in, in as quiet a way as possible. And that's where we've got to. So when I speak to Nikki Doucette, who is the person who now runs women's professional football, I voice these concerns only out of passion. We are the club that spends the highest proportion of our revenues on women's football of any men's professional, professional football club. So I'm not being lectured by anyone telling me that we don't care about women's football. We care about women's football. We are just so, so frustrated about what's been set up. Well, I've got lots of them pick there, uh, Charlie. Uh, um, well, first of all, obviously, it's club owned. So the clubs now completely control it. So if the clubs want to bring in cost controls, the clubs bring in cost controls, and I would expect them to bring in. And I think the, it's inevitable that as NUCO develops, a, a hard salary cap will come in. And that is completely the decision, really, of, of the 24 clubs uh, around what cost controls. And, and I think I'm working with a number of leagues across the world currently, and they're all thinking about, if they haven't got them already, they're all thinking about how do we manage the cost base and do we bring in a hard cap and how do we make sure that, that we get hold of this uh, growing um, player salaries particularly. Um, so, I mean, that is in the gift now of NUCO and the clubs to, to bring that in. Um, so, you know, it's so ultimately all the decisions will be made by the 24 clubs. Um, so that's the first thing. I think um, Karen Carney, that's an interest. I mean, I... I I'm going to defend Karen Carney. I thought it was an excellent report because she set out what she thought football needed. What uh, I d I've said all along, and, and I said in the Guardian as well, um, the thing with the Karen Carney report is it doesn't have the teeth and it doesn't have the money. I think that the men's game, um, which let's face it, is funded by the Premier League all the way down the pyramid. Let's not kid ourselves. Up some it's funded by, it's funded by owners, Kelly. It's funded by owners. It's not funded yeah, by the Premier owners League. and fifty percent, uh, up to fifty percent of a club's turnover, um, ranging from so thirty to fifty percent, is Premier League solidarity. The women's game it's has not. no solidarity. It's not. It's it not. Does, well, it does cause it's not. The financial it's numbers. It's fourteen percent. It's fourteen percent. Oh, no, yeah. Some of the clubs, it's a lot higher than that. It might be fourteen at Charlton, um, but they're in without doubt. Men's football is partly propped up alongside owners, um, which we'll come to in a second by um, solidarity. Now, the women's game was banned for years by uh, men, and and I think that the the men's game should fund uh, some money towards women's football. It should be ring fenced and protected to help it start to build and grow. So I think women's football should be part of solidarity, and I think it should be part of the regulator as well. Um, but I think uh, we are seeing, it's hard to know what the women's section of clubs is worth. It's without doubt, particularly, in, uh, let me tell you WSL, because I appreciate championship is really hard, because you're trying, trying to build the WSL from zero. It's an amateur sport or semi-professional in 2018. We're now only in 2024. We're trying to build the very top tier. And so I think it's really, really hard for the championship. But I completely get everything you said about it, sort of the struggle of the championship. But if you take the WSL, those clubs have increased in value. We can't see that because they're, lot, they're part of an overall club and nobody so far has decided to separate them and try and test them in the market and see what they're worth. But you, know, you can see the values rising in the NWSL um, the values are rising in, in the clubs but, and private equity is hovering and ringing me every week interested in investing in women's football. But I think it's finding it hard to get in because they're part of these big, big global um, brand clubs. Um, and so nobody's gone down that route. But I think it will happen. And I know those conversations are taking place in some clubs where clubs are thinking about getting investors in to help put the sorts of funding in that's going to make the product uh and the, and market it, you know, make it a viable proposition, but it's not going to happen overnight. You know, those we've still got players who came in, who were playing, you know, started their career almost as amateur footballers. The product's only going to get better. It needs investment. It needs, I mean, Arsenal and some clubs have shown what you can do in terms of building an audience and attendances. Um, if you invest in it, in a great product and market it, um, but we're right at the start of that journey. So I don't think you can strike women's football off as it's never going to be viable. I think it's, you know, it's really, really early in its journey. I, I, sorry, I, I definitely didn't say it can never be vulnerable. I think it could already be viable. I think that you've just said that you think that it's entirely within the gift of the clubs as to mm. cost control. Um, well, that's, um, that's true. But as Adrian knows, once the very biggest men's professional football clubs get a hold on something, they are relentless in their determination to dominate that thing. and that they have made sure that they they have the final say in anything that happens in the women's professional game. And what they will say is, well, 
we have revenues of five to six hundred million pounds a year. So for us to chuck three or four million pounds at our women's club is not a big deal. And we want to compete in the Women's Champions League. So actually, we don't want a cost cap because that's going to stop us competing in the Women's Champion, Champions League. So you've got three or four clubs controlling the entire thing, saying we don't care about the health of the domestic game at all. We just don't care. Um, all we care about is that we can compete against PSG and Barcelona when it comes to the, to, to the Women's Champions League. So effectively, that's why there hasn't been a cap. Now, what's happened as a result of that is that wage bills have spiralled to 10 to 12 million pounds a year. So to put that in context, that is much higher than a normal professional men's rugby club, right? On what basis? I have no idea. Absolutely no idea whatsoever. There's no reason for it. The revenues do not indicate that whatsoever. And is your argument, Charlie, then, that as the owner or part owner of a club at the level below the WSL that you don't want to go into the WSL simply because you will not be competitive. You cannot compete with these clubs who are putting unlimited amounts of money into their playing staff and who see it partly as a brand building exercise, not just as a, a football on the pitch exercise. That's correct. It's a CSR play for the very biggest clubs. They need to be able to turn to their very biggest sponsors and say, we've ticked the box, but we are doing women's football properly. And what I would like to have seen is a gradual growth of women's professional football with an accompanying cost cap that rises in line with revenues and with the growth of the game, being relatively relaxed as the NWSL is about whether you can compete with Barcelona or anything like that. It's not important. In the medium term, that is simply not important. Um, we can get there in the end, but we do need to grow the game in order to be able to get there. The only outcome to the Carney report, and it's, it was inevitable, and to everything that Kelly's been saying, is that the only people who can afford to pay for the massive increase in what Kelly calls investment, that I call CSR spending, the massive increase in investment required could only be afforded by the very biggest men's Premier League clubs. And it, inevitably what that means is simply replicating the men's professional game in the women's professional game almost literally directly without any thought given as a marketeer would give to, are these necessarily the right franchises in the right parts of the country to be able to actually sustainably grow a proper women's professional game? Because the men's professional game developed 130 years ago at a time when the population um, dispersion within the UK was quite different and the, the sort of demographics were very, very different. So you're going to end up with a large proportion of clubs in the Northwest. Well done. Congratulations. It's not where the men's football club, where the men's professional football scene would, have, would want to start if they were starting now, but that's where they are. The difference is that those clubs draw, those men's professional clubs in the Northwest draw, obviously on substantial numbers of supporters elsewhere in the country and elsewhere in the world, support what is otherwise a much too thin a dem demographic to support a lot of very big clubs in the Northwest. It's not the most wealthy or heavily populated part of the country. It's just where the original professional men's game started. In terms of investability, if people are speaking to Kelly, please point them in our direction. We have a fully separated women's club. Ours is a separate business, always has been a separate business. And we're really ambitious for it. We want to do well with it. But we simply cannot, at the moment, go any further than we are currently going. The result of, um, of this is what happened to Bristol City last year. So Bristol City won the championship, went up to the women's WSL one and got absolutely wiped out. You know, that they 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 spent as much as could reasonably be expected to have been spent. I mean, they pushed their wage budget up from around about um, you know, eight to nine hundred thousand pounds to about one point six million pounds, which by the way is comparable to a men's league two club, which would have much higher revenues. Um and then just got wiped out. They got six points in the entire season. And I think that just in indicates the total failure of a competition. It's just a, a failure. I mean, if, if you get to a point where people don't want to be in it, don't want to be promoted to it, then that is prima facie the failure of a competition, in my view. And unless people get real here, then it's not going to happen. In terms of just comparing the, the men's solidarity, I mean, look, I've got to be honest with you, your numbers are wrong there, Kelly. I mean, just absolutely wrong. So our, rev our revenues at Charleston are 13 million pounds a year which 1.5 million pounds is solidarity, right? That's 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 a fact. Ticketing is around about 6 million pounds. Our commercial revenue is around about 3 to 4 million pounds. And our owner input is about 5 to 6 million pounds. Right. Well, that, the numbers of football finance experts and people I wrote the article. Those, with, well, the, I, 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 I can tell you. Wrong, but I can tell me, you. I'm going to be more positive. I'm going to be more positive. I'm going to say that I think that the clubs across Europe do want a salary cap. 
I think it's different for the NWSL because they don't compete in a Champions League equivalent at the moment. Um, so although they have uh, uplifted their cap quite considerably um, in the announcement of the new collective bargaining agreement recently. But I think there is definitely buy-in across Europe for a salary cap. It probably needs to be some sort of Europe-wide uh, conversation because of the Champions League and the growing importance of the Women's Champions League. But I, I think it, it can be done and I think it will be done. I think it being a bit harsh be, about the whole sort of setup and structure because you've got to remember that before 2018, women were playing uh, football for England. Uh, they weren't even fully professional. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that women were taking their uh, holidays to play for England. Um, and the Lionesses, you know, and we had to find a way to try and get those women to be professional athletes so that they could be the best that they could be and that, that could massively lift England because England weren't even qualifying for tournaments. And so all of that happened because the bigger clubs stepped up and made women's professional football happen. Without that, the Lionesses wouldn't have won. And certainly, if the Lionesses hadn't have won, we wouldn't be having the conversation we started with at the beginning about the massive growth in women's football if it wasn't so visible with the WSL and the Lionesses. And that was started by the only way that we could possibly do it to start with, which was to get the richer men's clubs to fund and enable professional football. Because at that point, there wasn't any private equity and there wasn't any commercial interest. There was just nothing to go off. So we had to start somewhere and that has shifted the game up. But I do think that it doesn't mean that we can't, the game can't bring in cost controls and get hold of, and I think the game would benefit from cost controls because um, it would drive, it would make it more competitive. You know, and we all know that outside of the NWSL, most of the leagues in Europe are dominated by top few clubs and uh, and the leagues aren't competitive enough from top to bottom. So I think some sort of cost controls across Europe um, would help that and, and strengthen, um, strengthen it. So, so, when you say, so, so when we say, so mm -hmm. when we say some sort of cost controls, I mean, when, when I'm in, involved in discussions about um, this behind the scenes, they're talking about, well, we now that it's gone to 10, 12 million, we can't put that genie back in the bottle. So let's just try and make sure it doesn't keep on going higher than that, right? So effectively that locks in a loss um, for a normal women's professional football club of let's say four to five million pounds a year. Um, so effectively you're saying, one, one is saying that for the foreseeable future, the only clubs that are going to be able to compete in women's football are basically the, the men's champions league clubs really. Um, because they're the ones with the revenues that can afford five to six million pounds a year, because even the smaller Premier League clubs are not very keen on losing five to six million pounds a year on anything that they do. Um, so the league won't be competitive. And the, and this is, goes back to my original sin point, which is that the main point when you're devising sports competitions, professional sports competitions are not CSR plays. They are actually meant to be, um, you know, a fond of transfer of money from people who find it attractive to watch it to people who play it. And people like me and, and you, Kelly, sit in the middle of that, trying to ensure that that's, that transaction is done in a reasonable and fair way. Um, and what we're doing here is creating, deliberately creating a non-competitive league to try to accelerate the amount that women's professional football players get paid, basically, um, is, is what I think pretty much what you've just said, is that that was regarded as being more important to get them up to being paid as much as men's professional footballers. To be paid, than, I was talking about being paid from being amateur. So why not have a salary? So why was so why wasn't there a salary cap from the start? Because you could have like N NWSL. Let's say there was a salary cap of four million pounds, right? Something like that for the very top clubs, which would ensure that the women women's professional footballers were paid more than professional cricketers, for instance, except men's professional cricketers. Um, why wasn't that put in place? And why do we think that it actually will be when there's really no incentive for the biggest three or four clubs to do so because it will effectively and their domination, easy domination of the game, which in turn is is not something that they're, not, that they're generally willing to countenance. Well, there was a soft cap. It was 40% of all spend um, that, that you spent on women's football could be spent on salary. So it was a soft cap in, in the WSL. But I imagine that they would move to a hard cap as salaries are rising. Those salaries have moved up very, very quickly. I mean, I, as I understood it, there are some things that the WSL clubs will vote on, some things that the championship will vote on and some that they'll all vote on. But I can't see, even in the WSL, how um, if you you keep talking about the three or four, but there's still eight or so that are not the three or four. And so I would have thought that collectively there'd be enough clubs that would want to bring in 
uh, tighter cost controls around around salaries. The, the, the problem you've got is that effectively the whole game, and Adrian's touched on this before, it, in its dash for cash, um, the whole game is now in hock to the Premier League um, and is of, literally in hock, as in it owes £20 million. And who are the clubs who, as they would see it, give the majority of that money in, in terms of having the highest revenue generating power of the men, men's Premier League? It's, it is the big six. Um, and the big six um, are, you know, rep, are the ones represented at the top of the WSL one as well. They made sure they had a voting lock on um, significant matters, as Adrian's again pointed out before, in terms of the control that they have, which, you know, given that they're the ones paying the majority of it, it's very difficult to argue against. Um, and so and so we go on. I, I mean, soft caps, I'm, I, I've am i been at so many conferences. So I'm like, what, what is the point of a soft cap? I don't understand it. Mm. Well, it, was it meant I to be some soft cap when I came in in 2018? But I, I sort of, uh, the the benefit I did see of it was that it sort of forced some off pitch spend. So for every pound, uh, you know, that you had to spend, you spent on salaries, then then you need to be spending pounds off pitch, whether that's in people capability, marketing, infrastructure, etc. So um, I, I could see that it did force a sort of a spread of investment and not just uh, a, a chase for salaries. But um, yeah, I appreciate a hard cap um, would be the thing that would 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 I suppose cap off uh, the, the the growth um, in salaries. But I'm still not convinced uh, that most clubs, many clubs, are really trying to drive it commercially. It's interesting that you call it a CSR play. Um, can I just interrupt I there and say? Business, can, yeah. can I can I just mm -hmm. interrupt there and say for people? Who You've heard that phrase. CSR means corporate social responsibility, and it's a it's a metric that companies often FTSE listed companies use to show that they're interested in more than simply the financial bottom line. That they are good actors in society as well. That's what CSR represents. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I see it as a more as a sort of a startup that needs investment. Um, ahead of longer term revenue growth and and the clubs are stepping up in off in terms of driving the off pitch piece of it you know thinking through commercial strategy trying to find the brands that are interested purpose driven brands that are interested in women's football unbundling some of those commercial rights selling them separately or attributing a value if they are going to bundle them uh, and sell them thinking through and investing in marketing the, the clubs are miles apart in their efforts uh, they're miles apart in their efforts to generate uh, when you look at the P&Ls of the clubs around commercial income Arsenal are miles ahead on building the fan base um, absolutely how have they got so far ahead why well, it says to me that clubs aren't stepping up um, is that part of the problem it's Kelly? interesting that Char you know Chelsea Correct. kick off WSL first game of the season and it's in a three and a half thousand pound a three and a half thousand people venue Mm. You know, why is it not a Stanford Bridge? Yeah. You know, uh, got to step up. Is, is there an issue? Is there an issue there, Kelly? In that I, clearly for a club like Arsenal, who've done so well to drive support for their women's team, and there's been a whole club buying there. But in other parts of the country and other clubs, for whatever reason, that clearly hasn't happened. Is there an argument that overall for the women's game, it would actually be better for those clubs to be completely independent? of these big brands for themselves to grow organically as they were before the WS often were before the WSL started? Well, I think it's hard because you can imagine how much resource up front would be required to run a completely separate women's football club. I mean, it'd be interesting to see, won't it, how London City Lionesses do with Michelle Kang's investment. Um, I think it's sort of fascinating sort of uh, test and it'll be really interesting to see if any clubs do sell a stake or sell part of um, you know the women's club to, to get investment in and, and see how that happens but you know Arsenal obviously part of you know Arsenal women are part of a made you know major uh, big overall club with a you know global brand but I've shown that by um, investing in the product but really investing in the marketing of it and delivering a great match day experience and consistently doing it instead of these occasional one-off big games. They're, I think, the 11th highest attendance of all men's and women's football last year. So it can be done, but it's just really patchy. Yeah. So, I, 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 
Yeah, I think that's all true. And look, I think what the FA has done for women's football has been amazing. Um, if it wasn't for the grants that we still get from the FA to help with marketing and promotion, et cetera, then we, re we really wouldn't be able to make um, all those grants are now obviously separate. But, you know, that it, effectively without the FA, we wouldn't have been able to make professional women's football work at all. I am deeply concerned about the decision to have non-closed top division um, because I think that is causing a real problem in terms of clubs investment as a whole. Um, it's really only it's a luxury that really only men's professional football can generally afford is full promotion, relegation, etc. And I think, again, this desperate urge to copy the men's professional game has caused deep, deep problems. Um, if you look at the average attendances in the WSL Championship, um, Newcastle are managing, I think, about a couple of thousand, something like that. Um, the rest of us are about 600, 650 people. And that's really not the basis for a professional sport. I would say 20, 25% of our efforts do go into trying to promote women's professional football attendance. And it is extremely difficult, um, you know, in the WSL Championship, particularly as you're in a league, which, as I said, the majority of clubs don't actually want to win. And that is a sort of, you know, again, a fundamental problem. And the other issue, which I would just, you know, is, is a problem. I mean, we are subsidizing our women's club heavily enough that our women's players do get properly paid. But because most women's professional football clubs in the championship do not want to win it, you're starting to see a reversion on pay down towards minimum wage. And I think that's causing welfare issues, if I'm being honest with you. Um, there was obviously one very notable case last year. But, you know, is it better for these types of athletes to be on very, very low um, full-time wages? Or was it better when they were being paid to play football on top of their, their day jobs as well? So there's just a whole load of stuff in there, which I think, you know, does need to be thought through. OK, Charlie, thank you. Kelly, I'd love to give you the final word, but we've run out of time. We'll speak again, though. Thank you so much for your Thanks time. So Kelly Simmons, OBE. Thank you to Charlie Methven, as always. Thank you to Jed Thomas for producing this episode and to Mark Machado for his socials at 11.29. Thanks for listening as well. We'll see you again next week. Uh, by all means, let us know what you think about this week's episode. Lots of uh, very interesting stuff. Thank you. See you again. Cheers now. Bye-bye.